This edition of FedGov Today with Francis Rose is sponsored by Splunk and Kerasoft. On this edition of FedGov Today with Francis Rose, inside the technology operation in the office of the Secretary of Defense, the cyber defense that government can't build alone, and special operations in the air and in space. Welcome to FedGov Today with Francis Rose. The office of the Secretary of Defense is seven months into its effort to digitize itself through its Information Management and Technology Directorate. The Deputy Secretary of Defense, Kathleen Hicks, laid out her vision for the directorate in a document called Modernizing the Digital Experience in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Danielle Metz is Director of Information Management and Technology and Director of Administration and Management in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Danielle, welcome. Thanks for coming on the program. Thank you, Francis. What was the operational direction that you were pushed to go in when you transitioned from OCIO in DOD to the office that you occupy now? So I think before I answer that question, it's really good to provide a little context into how OSD got to where it is. And so, as we mentioned before, in April of last year, we did a huge study to assess the landscape of the IT posture for OSD. And we came up with a number of findings and recommendations. And the findings were what you would think. After 15, 20 years of IT consolidation and treating technology less than, um, OSD, was unable to execute any of its missions. Um, and so we had disjointed, we had angry users. They didn't know why they were angry, they just couldn't do their job. And so we recognized that we needed to have uh, an entity, an organization that would be the leader for IT as well as an advocate for OSD and really unify OSD and treat it as a, a unified component on the same plane as a military department. And to have that, you need to have a CIO. And so we were able to leverage the work that I did as the deputy CIO with what we wanted to do with digital modernization, cloud adoption, and apply those best practices and the failures that we had there into creating this OSD IT enterprise. Mm -hmm. What do you think, uh, what did skills that you uh, gained as the deputy CIO in the CIO's office apply most to what you're doing now? I think the biggest takeaway is the fact that we had to center on the user, that the user is at the heart of our strategy, and we needed to be more creative with how we talked about and change the attitude and the mindset of technology. That it's not a back office function, that it's not, hey, I can't send this email, it is something much bigger than that. Because technology is what is the critical enabler to anything that the Department of Defense does, regardless of what your mission is. And so treating technology on par with all the missions that we do is really important. How the CIO is viewed as a leader in the C-suite that's able to drive that digital transformation changes. And then focusing not only just on the delivery of technology, but really the people and the processes to be able to maximize the technology. You said the users were angry and they didn't know why. It doesn't matter why, I suppose, right? That's right. As long as their, if their stuff doesn't work, that's what's the problem. That's right, and they don't need to know why it's not working. That's the responsibility of the technologists. That's what the Office of CIO brings to bear. And so how we go about describing that, we have uh, this idea of um, in-chair. You're a user that is like, hmm, I am doing a Teams call, but my mic is not enabled on my laptop. I will chat you my questions. Well, that takes away the whole collaborative experience of what we're trying to achieve. Um, or it takes two months to have a laptop issued or any type of end user devices. So we wanted to be able to target that, to be able to focus on how do we address what the user needs and have that be an in-chair response. And then build upon that for your in-computer problems where you have processes that are broken or kind of antiquated. They're really hindering your ability to maximize technology. Um, or we have lifecycle replacement that doesn't really exist uh, because we don't know what our baseline asset management is. So going about some of the basic hygiene to go about uh, that is incredibly important. Um, and then the last piece, is, which is where we've typically always focused on, is in-system problems. So those gnarly problems that take multi-year, a lot of money, it's the right thing to do. But the users don't really get to see any benefit. 
And the idea is, how do you describe all that? And then tie the thread from your user all the way down to the fundamental issues and then be able to drive those changes. So I mentioned the document from uh, Deputy Secretary Hicks. As I read that, it struck me as a, a, a vision document more so than an execution document. How are you turning that vision into operations? Well, we delivered an implementation plan where we highlighted three goals that we wanted to be able to do, which was one, flip uh, the delivery model from it being a service provider-led to customer-led. And in order to do that, you we needed to create forums where we bring the users in to be able to understand their viewpoints, what's working, what is not, understand what their requirements are, and then collectively from an OSD perspective, prioritize that. And then we're able to go after the advocacy for the dollars, build implementation plans, and drive those changes. Um, I think the other, the other one was treat OSD as an IT enterprise. And so that was creating this community, this identity, that instead of having 17 separate PSAs, they had to figure things out for themselves. We now represent the OSD, and we are treating ourselves as a unified component. And lastly, maximizing the technology. It's not enough just to put the technology out and expect the users to figure it out. We really need to be able to have dynamic training, um, do creative champion programs where we're able to kind of train the trainer, uh, and then be able to redo our policies that are holding us back. And the example that I use is the fact that a lot of our policies are fairly antiquated. So when we have teams, which is supposed to be this perfect collaboration experience, if you don't have a camera, if you don't have a mic, then it's just really a telephone call. That is not what we want to have in 2023. So how much of the issue that you mentioned earlier about the chief information officer, the role that you happen to occupy now, being at the table, being a part of the decision-making process here, part of the C-suite, how much of that is a chicken and egg? How much of it is dependent on you and your team's performance, and how much of it is dependent on those other people, other stakeholders saying, we want this person involved in the decision-making process? Yeah, I think it is an interesting balancing act because for so long, those PSAs had to fight for themselves. And some did really well, and others did not. What we're offering is a democratization of technology and the access to technology to do your job and to do it well. And so there is a part where we have to, a value proposition where we have to prove ourselves. And I think we've done that in the past eight months. We've been able to uh, create the governance forums where we have user feedback, accountability, transparency. We're able to advocate for dollars. We're doing a global service desk, which is a huge modernization effort of the service desk in the Pentagon reservation. We were successful in that because we knew what needed to happen. We listened to the users um, in the PSAs when we did listening sessions. We continue doing those listening sessions because of the importance of understanding what our customers' needs are. And they can see that we're fighting for them. And then they get excited by that because they're seeing that they are being heard, that they are being empowered, and they're doing a better job because of the technology that we're giving to them. We have about a minute left, Danielle. A lot of what you've described so far is uh, important but there might not be specific markers. What markers are you setting to determine at some future point, year from now, two years from now, we're on track, we're doing this the way that we want to do it? So for the Global Service Desk, we're gonna start that implementation in FY24. Um, that is gonna be significant. The next thing that we are working on, we have user surveys that we started in February. This is the first time ever that OSD is being able to, on a monthly basis, um, understand and, and get to provide feedback uh, for us, and we're taking all of that, that body of work, and creating a five-year strategic plan. And then based on that, we can advocate for resources and then be able to track it in those governance forums to ensure that we're on the right track. And all the while, the user is the one that's guiding us through this. So if the user is not satisfied, it doesn't matter why they're not satisfied, we need to make sure that they're able to do their job. How much is it important to get specific feedback, though, from those users, not just, I'm not happy, I don't like this? It's extremely important, and I think the first step is getting the baseline, and then based on that information, we'll be able to tweak and have better questions to get better answers to be able to guide to where the strategy needs to go. Danielle Metz, thanks very much for joining me. It's great to have you on the Thank program. Thank you, Francis. You can read more about OSD's Information Management and Technology Directorate at fedgovtoday.com. Coming next, the cyber defense the government can't build alone. FedGov Today with Francis Rose continues in a moment.
If you want insights from agency and industry leaders on the latest topics in technology, management, workforce, defense, and acquisition, sign up for the FedGov Today podcast with me, Francis Rose. I release new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday, so you'll stay up to date on the issues that matter most to federal government leaders. Listen at FedGovToday.com and everywhere you get your shows. Don't miss out on the conversation. Follow the podcast today. Welcome back. The National Cybersecurity Strategy includes five pillars that the authors of the strategy say are designed to, quote, build and enhance collaboration. Two of those pillars could be absolute musts for collaboration. John Powell's area vice president for U.S. Department of Defense for Splunk. John, welcome. Thanks for coming on the program. Pillar one is defend critical infrastructure. What are the collaboration opportunities and maybe the collaboration musts for that one? Yeah, so I, I think it really revolves around obviously the partnership between the government and industry to, you know, to, to secure industrial control systems. I mean, that is really a big factor right now um, with aging systems and um, software that's not designed to be network centric. You, you have siloed information. How do we connect that all? How do we create a resilient security posture around it? Uh, how do we help the government, uh, you know, protect the electrical grid? How do we help them, uh, you know, uh, do the things that they need to do to ensure that if we got involved in a conflict with a, a foreign nation, that, uh, you know, we're securing the, the things that keep things running here. You know? I've noted over the last 15 years that just about every government official, whenever they talk about cyber in virtually any context, references 85 to 90 percent of the critical infrastructure in the country is in private hands. Does that make the job of the government, does that make the job of the cyber professionals in industry that work with the government, does that make their job more difficult or easier? Um, I, I think it, it makes it challenging, right, because of what you pointed out. It really is, how do we connect player A with player B with player C? So you've got the government on one hand, you've got the Dominion Powers and the, the infrastructure companies on one hand, and you've also got the cybersecurity industry on the other side, the software machine that's there to help provide these services and products to help secure those things. So it can be, it, it will be challenging, you know, and it's, um, it, it's always a matter of who's willing to step up and who's willing to spend money, you mm -hmm. know, that's one of the big things. When collaboration works among all of those stakeholders that you just described, how does it work well? You know, I think it's I think it's a propensity to take some some risks, right? And uh, you know, reach out to private sector to and say we need help. Like, help us figure out how to do this. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, one of the big things is openness. But again, I think it's you know, getting private industry to invest money in the things that the government's asking for. You know, that's a good example. Of that is you know, cloud services, right? The government said, hey, we have rules and regulations about what we need from you in order to buy your products, invest money, you know, and, and do these and we'll, we'll buy them for you. And that's, that's when it works the best is when the, the companies put that effort forward, invest money in products and services that are specifically designed for the government. And then the government obviously steps in and, and procures those and uses them for the purposes that they're intended. The other pillar where collaboration seems like a must is pillar three, shaping market forces to drive security and resilience. And you talked about resilience <laughs> in the regards to the first pillar. Does everybody have the same definition of resilience to, to as a starting point? It's a new term, term, right? It's a new term that the government uh, has started using. It's a new term that my company started using. Uh, I think the big one with pillar three is something that's been in the news and it's been a, you know, a lot of concern to uh, the software industry, which is really an S-bomb, uh, similar to what you get uh, around the supply chain issues around computer hardware, right? The government needs to know, hey, was part of this made in an adversarial nation? You know, uh, where was this assembled? Uh, you know, the chip shortage I think we've had recently has highlighted that. And so, so now the government's saying, hey, step up. If you've got development efforts in China, let us know. Like, we need to know that, right? Uh, and that's really what the SBOM is designed to, to address. Um, going to be difficult uh, for industry and government around the, just like you said, the collaboration to make that come to fruition, but it's important. You know, the government needs to know if foreign actors are contributing to the software that they're buying. I mean, because as you've seen before, you know, they, nation, foreign nations can put bugs, can put malware into a production version of software and exploit that 
you know, within the, within inside the government's networks. Uh, less than 30 seconds left. What do you think you and your colleagues in industry can do to help the government fulfill all five of these pillars in the cybersecurity strategy? I think one of the big things is, and I've seen this over you know my 25 years of working with the government. We you've got to understand the language that the government uses and and the requirements they have and build the products to suit those needs. Rather than, hey, I'm big industry, I'm gonna come in and shove my agenda down your throat and what I need you know, from you, we've gotta to listen to the government and do what they're asking us to do so that we can help them become more resilient. John Powell, thanks very much for joining thanks. me. It's great to have you on the program. Appreciate it. You can find a link to the National Cybersecurity Strategy and read more about executing at fedgovtoday.com. Up next, special operations in the air and in space. FedGov Today will be right back. If you want insights from agency and industry leaders on the latest topics in technology, management, workforce, defense, and acquisition, Sign up for the FedGov Today podcast with me, Francis Rose. I release new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday, so you'll stay up to date on the issues that matter most to federal government leaders. Listen at FedGovToday.com and everywhere you get your shows. Don't miss out on the conversation. Follow the podcast today. Welcome back. Air Force Special Operations Command standing up a new directorate to train and equip the next generation of air commandos. AFSOC says the Air Commando Development Directorate will provide policy, oversight, and guidance. Lieutenant General Tony Bauernfeind is the commander of Air Force Special Operations Command. At Soft Week 2023 in Tampa, he told me about his command's mission. Our job is to provide unconventional and specialized air power in support of our teammates, and those teammates being Joint Special Operations Command, the Theater Special Operations Command, and those air components commanders that are forward in the regions. What are the elements that you need, equipment-wise, people skill-wise, whatever, to be able to deliver on that mission, sir? Well, at the end of the day, sir, it starts with the fact that our, compar our competitive advantage are our air commandos. Our people are amazing. We've got uh, 21,715 great teammates, active duty, guard, reserve, government civilians that are out there providing exemplary results for the joint war, war fighters every day. And they're innovative by nature. There's a strong culture of providing different solutions to the wicked hard problems that we have in front of us. And the culture of AFSOC is strong in that regards. Now those people need great equipment to move forward. And uh, we are um, um, very much blessed with great support from United States Special Operations Command, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for um, Special Operations and Low Intensity Conflict, as they make sure we get the right soft peculiar resourcing. But we never forget also that our Air Force, Secretary of the Air Force and Chief of Staff of the Air Air Force also provide us great support for our Air Force unique aspects on uh, as we move forward. But we, as we are moving forward, um, having great people properly equipped has proven to be successful for us in the accomplishment of our missions. I know from your command's website that the vision of the command is air commandos ready today, relevant tomorrow, resilient always. What's your vision for achieving each of those three pieces? As we move forward, I've been, uh, been in command now for just a uh, over four months time. And uh, we are gonna update our website. We had a great opportunity about after 90 days to spend some time with the entirety of the staff and take the great strategic guidance that had been in place before under uh, Lieutenant General Slife, the, the prior commander. And that worked during his tenure. The environment has changed a little bit. So we're adjusting our priorities and acknowledging that our three lines of effort and our three priorities are we are America's Air Commandos, ready to fight tonight and pathfinding for the future. And what I mean by that is when we say we are America's Air Commandos, it goes to that culture of being problem solvers, being innovative. And it takes every single member of the team to bring a diverse perspective of thoughts, insights, and just different solutions to the wicked problems we're solving. 
Inside of Air Force Special Operations Command, over 75% of our force is either combat support or combat service support. And they also are air commandos because air commando is not a job, it's a mindset. It's having that mindset to go, we have got problems and how are we bring, going to bring innovative solutions for the joint warfighter as you go forward. And it's critical that we invest in those air commandos and make sure that we have a culture and a climate that encourages diversity, but most importantly, encourages inclusion. Mm -hmm. That know that, hey, I'm a part of the team where I'm seen, I'm heard, I'm valued. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Second one is ready to fight tonight. And that is a priority. We are never sure when the nation is going to need us. We will have some insights, but we always want to be ready when the nation calls. And that means that you're physically ready, spiritually ready, morally ready, medically ready, that your family is ready. Nobody wants to leave their families, but when the nation calls, we're going to be ready to respond, just like we have done numerous times over the last few years, and we're never short of that. Mm -hmm. And then finally is pathfinding through the future is acknowledging that those great innovative ideas that we're gonna go forward, we can turn so much faster. We're smaller, we're creative, and we bring those ideas forward um, as we um, attack those problems that our joint force and our nation is uh, facing. And just very proud to uh, support that team. You mentioned that the vision is pivoting because the landscape has changed. How has the landscape changed and how did you uh, reshape the vision to suit that? What will you have to do differently in your command in order to meet the way the landscape has changed? Well, as we have moved forward with, with the publication of the 2018 National Defense Strategy and now the follow-up of the 2022 National Defense Strategy, it has become clear that we have several areas that we have to focus our efforts upon. Um, first and foremost is the National Defense Strategy made it very clear that we have pacing challenges that we have got to prepare for that to be honestly, for the last two decades, we didn't. But we do not have the luxury of doing a complete pivot to the pacing challenge, because mm -hmm. the National Defense Strategy also says that we have, still have to protect the homeland and keep that focus on those counter violent extremist organization threats that are forward. And then finally, to that ready to fight tonight mindset is, there will be crises out there, whether it be need to support an embassy in East Africa, whether it need to um, rescue an American that is you know, trapped in a foreign land, to bring them home, and we just have to have those capabilities. I would offer to you, if we look past two decades ago, it was probably about 20% crisis response, 80% counter violent extremist organizations. General Fenton, as he has come in as the United States Special Operations Command Commander, has said that the 2022 National Defense Strategy is very clear that we've also got to pivot, we need to pivot to great power competition. So he has asked us to spend about 60% of our time and effort on great power competition, integrated deterrence campaigning, 20% on crisis response, and 20% on counter violent and extremist organizations. With the acknowledgement, there's a fourth C out there, we call it campaigning, crisis response, and counter VEO. And that fourth one is the one that we don't want to see, and that's combat or conflict. But we also know that we have a responsibility to provide that deterrent value so that our adversaries know that should they test us, we will be ready and able to decisively prevail in support of the nation, but with the acknowledgement that it's all about deterrence. And balancing those is what has changed in the operational environment. Speaking of pivoting, I'm going to pivot for a moment. You spoke here uh, on a panel titled Developing and Maintaining Talent. Uh, people obviously at the core of what everybody in the national defense community does. What was the message you wanted to convey to people on that panel? The big messages, and I would say it's two, is the first message was the true importance of inclusion and diversity to our team building as it goes forward. From a diversity perspective, as I've already discussed, the problems in front of us are incredibly difficult. All the easy ones have been solved. And we need teammates at the table that approach problems from a multiple different pathways of perspectives. So we need teammates that have got a diversity of backgrounds, experiences, you know, different thought leaders, so that we don't end up into the trap of groupthink of going down a pathway. And it only takes a single teammate to go, 
have we thought about this from a different perspective? And that is incredibly powerful. But we will only have those teammates speak up if they feel included. Mm -hmm. And inclusion is the most important part. I've said it before is, mm -hmm. to me, inclusion is feeling like you're a part of the team, that you're seen, you're heard, you're valued. And when you have that climate and culture of the diversity of perspectives we're looking for and that inclusion, that's a powerful mixture. And that is important to us as an enterprise as we move forward at all echelons throughout the command and throughout the Department of Defense, I would offer. But additionally, I would also say the second thing I want to put into that is we have to expend resources and our time investing in the next generation. So it's about also developing our air commandos. And thankfully, I've got a great teammate, Colonel Aries Mincer, who's kind of been pathfinding this for us. And we're establishing an air commando development center where we're changing the mindset where we would go traditionally go initial training. And then once you're with your operational unit, you stay there. Now we're gonna acknowledge that throughout your career, there's gonna be phases of development that you are gonna require to go to the next echelon from tactical, tactical operations to operational level of warfare, strategic level of warfare, to have that development and purposely develop our teammates as we prepare them to lead forces downrange. General, it's great to have you here. I appreciate your time today, thank you. No, thank you very much, Francis. You can read more about Air Force Special Operations Command at fedgovtoday.com. FedGov Today with Francis Rose is back in a moment. If you want insights from agency and industry leaders on the latest topics in technology, management, workforce, defense, and acquisition, sign up for the FedGov Today podcast with me, Francis Rose. I release new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday, so you'll stay up to date on the issues that matter most to federal government leaders. Listen at FedGovToday.com and everywhere you get your shows. Don't miss out on the conversation. Follow the podcast today. Welcome back in this week's event spotlight. ACT IAC will present the Health Innovation Summit June 8th in Reston. Speakers include the Chief Information Officer at HHS, Carl Mathias, Dr. Carolyn Clancy of the Department of Veterans Affairs, and many more leaders from across the government health IT community. You can read more about the event and find a link to register at fedgovtoday.com slash events. FedGov Today returns next Sunday morning at 1030. Hope you'll join me then. I'm Francis Rose. Thanks very much for watching. Have a great week. If you want insights from agency and industry leaders on the latest topics in technology, management, workforce, defense, and acquisition, sign up for the FedGov Today podcast with me, Francis Rose. I release new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday, so you'll stay up to date on the issues that matter most to federal government leaders. Listen at FedGovToday.com and everywhere you get your shows. Don't miss out on the conversation. Follow the podcast today.